So it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce my friend and collaborator and uh, colleague, Gunnar Martinson. He's at the Department of Mathematics and, and the Odin Institute in uh, UT Austin. Before that, he had a short period when he was at the University of Oxford in the numerical analysis group there. Before that, uh, at Colorado Boulder. Um, he is uh, very well known for his work in randomized linear algebra, which we'll be speaking about today as well as an expert in numerical PDs and integral boundary uh, integral problems. Um, and so uh, it's, he's been here for the last two days. We've had great discussions with him. And he's, um, one of his most popular works, because we all dream of having a paper where thousands of people will cite it. And sadly, uh, most of us don't end up doing that in our career. Gunnar has got one of those papers. And uh, as many people in the room probably know, this is the Siam Review paper which is uh, known as the randomized singular value decomposition, which is a uh, very kicked off randomized linear algebra in the field of numerical linear algebra. And he's going to be telling us uh, a couple of stories around that with uh, today's talk, Randomized Algorithms for Linear Algebra. Thank you very much. Thank you both for the invitation and a very kind introduction. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Very much appreciate it. It's a chance to talk to you. Um, Right, so I'm going to talk about a few different things. So I will start with describing basically the content of, um, of this paper that Alex mentioned. So this is, this is quite well established by now. Some of you may have seen these slides before. I recycled them on so I apologize. But I, I don't want to assume that everybody has already seen this stuff. It, has, it doesn't typically make its way to classes. So there, there are a lot of people who haven't seen it. But if I bore some people in the first half of the talk, I apologize. So uh, that's part one. Part two are things that are relatively well established, but there's a slightly different formulation of it than from the way I used to think of it, which might be of interest. And then to the extent we have time left, I'll talk about some more recent work that's maybe of more narrow interest, but it's, it's recent and I think it's very fun. So if I get time, I'll do it. All right, so the basic problem I'm going to talk about is uh, it's, a very, it's a very fundamental problem in linear algebra. You're given a matrix. You can think of A as being a large matrix. That's really where these methods are used the most. You want to compute an approximate low rank factorization, so some factor E that's been this way, and some factor F star. So a star is uh, transpose and adjoint for me. So that's the factorization. And this, of course, comes up in tons of things. It's, it's a fundamental problem in computational statistics. You have a bunch of measured data. You want to fit it to not in a very abnormal distribution. That's SVD, basically. They think of it as PCA. There are tons of applications in uh, model reduction in scientific computing. The way we came into this was that we were looking at variations of algorithms such as the fast multiple method that really relies on the direct approximation. But we wanted to make an algebraic version of it. So you had to adaptively compute the low rank approximations between all the objects that interact. And that, that's really how we started thinking about these randomized type algorithms. And uh, of course, it's a fundamental problem in data analysis as well. <coughs> all right. So this is a well-studied problem. If you ask somebody 20 years ago, I'm sure they would say that it was fully understood and you know, everything. And it's true in many ways that the, the algorithms that existed, they, they were great. So, the best thing you can do is to compute the full singular value decomposition of A. It's quite expensive. It has cubic complexity in the matrix dimensions. But if the matrix is not too large, or if gathering it is very expensive, if it's costly for you, it's expensive experimental data, then you should definitely go with point one here, because it's, it gives you, basically, it's optimal in many ways mathematically. It's a numerically <coughs> extremely robust algorithm. Then, if you have large matrices, then I would say the, the go-to method would be private methods. So in particular, if you have large sparse matrices, in that case, there are these private subspace matrices where you start with private subspace matrices where you start with some vector, you apply A to it, and you collect the, the series B, A, B, A squared B, and so on. And you, you restrict the matrix to that private space. And that also is in a certain sense optimal, that you cannot really do better in many ways if your budget is k matrix vector multiplies. 
Then another thing you can do is uh, you can, there are various pivoting strategies. So there's traditional column pivoting QR, which is pretty much the first technique we teach in linear algebra that you have a, a set of vectors you want to build an orthonormal basis for them. You just pick the largest, you normalize that's your first, you orthogonalize all the other ones with respect to the first, pick the largest of the remaining. So it's a very simple, greedy algorithm, but it's it works very well, and uh, it has complexity m and k, which is pretty good. Um, it's, uh, it's known to not always be optimal, but from a practical point of view, it's very close. All right, so despite the fact that we have all these techniques, I'll show you some ways that we can improve on this. But I wanted to first really make clear that you know, it's really a matter of improving on the existing, very impressive state of the art. All right, so the basic method, it looks like this without further ado. So one of the reasons that these quickly got a lot of users is that in the basic form, they're really very easy to code up. So here are six lines of MATLAB code that encodes the randomized algorithm that I'm going to describe. So the idea is simply that you take, you draw the tall thin matrix, omega, you populate the entries by sampling from a standard distribution standard distribution, so all the entries are independent. Then you form a sample matrix Y by multiplying A into your tool um, Yashin matrix. So note that the columns of Y are linear combinations of the columns of A. So necessarily the column space of Y lies inside the column space of A. And now the key claim, uh, so what I'm going to need to justify in order to make sense of everything else, the claim is that if the matrix has approximate rank k, then the columns of y do a reasonably good job of spanning the column space. There is some cells reasonably close to the, to the optimal choice, which would be to have, so the problem I'm aiming for in these two steps is to approximate the column space of the matrix. Right, so the optimal choice there is to take the space span by the first k left singular vectors. That's what I'm making for. So the claim is that, at least in certain cases, the columns of Y will span the space. That's doing re a reasonably close job than that. But they are a very low condition basis because they tend to all be aligned with the dominant singular vectors. So next you need to orthonormalize them. Then you project your matrix down to the space spanned by the basis you just built. So that gives you a matrix B that's aiming in this regard. As it only has K rows, I can afford to do expensive stuff. On B. So what I do next is I compute the full singular value decomposition of B. So this is inexpensive, and then I just map back to the original space using the basis. Right. And this is how I'm going to encode the key claim I make that the columns of Q form a reasonably good basis for the columns of A. And <clears throat> before we, so it's important to note that everything that happened in stage B. It doesn't change the approximation. That to the extent that this, there is a, something, I, I said I needed to justify this claim. But the only approximation here happens in this step. So if I understand how well aligned the space span by the columns of y is with the space span by the top k left singular vectors, that's really the question that I need to answer mathematically. All the rest stuff, all the other steps, it, it's really just cosmetics. I'm doing rotations on the approximation I've already built. All right, so this, uh, it, so I'll show you some numerics that will illustrate how well or this does or does not do different environments. So the key claim is, um, right, you'll see that what really determines how well this works is how rapid in the singular values of A decay, if they decay fast, then it does reasonably well. But uh, you can still get a little bit of suboptimality in that case. And the way to deal with that is that you draw a few extra samples. And this is really the key to the success of methods like this, that you can only go wrong in one direction. That you know that the column space of Y sits inside the column space of A. So I, I, that's the direction. I, I cannot go wrong in that direction. The way that this would fail is that I, I can miss stuff. There are directions I could miss. So I want to have contributions of all the top left k singular vectors, 
But it could be that, especially the ones associated with a small singular value set, you know, it could be that they fall a little bit outside my sample size. But this I can easily deal with by drawing a few extra samples. And then the mathematically interesting fact is that you don't need that many extra samples in order to get close, provably close, to the optimal one. But the point being that this is very different from the Monte Carlo type algorithm. But there you, you can go wrong in both directions. And you need a very precise random number generator that any bias in your random number generator is directly going to influence your computational results. So the method of this type is, is quite insensitive to those effects. Okay, so here I just reformulated it's exactly the same algorithm as on the previous slide. So in this talk, for the most part, when I present these things, I'm going to present them as if you tell me the numerical rank in advance. You tell me you want an approximation to rank 100, and then I'll tell you how to compute it. Of course, this is not what typically happens in practice. Oftentimes, you give a matrix, you give some data, you want an approximation, that's correct to three digits, and then it's, it's part of your job to figure out what rank do you need. So most of the methods that I describe can be adapted to this case. It's, you have to really arrange the computation a little bit, and they get more messy to describe, but just want to make clear that there are such variations of them. Um, another thing to observe in this algorithmic description is how simple the interaction with A is. So you interact with A only in this step and e. So there are only two types that you need it. So if it's stored on, say, a hard drive, this is very efficient, because you only need to read it into memory twice. Um, and more generally, even if it sits in RAM, it's yourself to be very efficient to do the matrix-matrix multiply. You can do it on the GPU very efficiently. Point thing, that in many applications, doing matrix-matrix multiply is much, much faster than doing k consecutive matrix vector multiply. So that is really the key to getting speed in all of these applications. Sometimes A is defined indirectly. It could be that you need to solve a PD. That's what applying A is. Say A is a, you know, it's a transfer function of some sort or other. And the way you can evaluate it is to run your PD. And then, oftentimes, many PD solvers have a structure that if you start with several different right-hand sides, you can still go through just one step of whatever your PD solver is and do them all at once, assuming you have enough memory, of course. So the basic scheme works well, as I mentioned, when the singular values decay rapidly. If they don't, then we do need to bring in a little bit more classical ideas, so things like, so this moves us a little bit closer towards tribal methods or subspace iteration, where you, you enhance the contribution of the dominant singular vectors by taking a power of the matrix. But this really gives more relative oomph to the eigenvectors associated with larger eigenvalues in each of us. So now, let's see um, how all this does in practice. It's time for some numerics. So the error I will show you is it's simply the error here. So if I restrict A to the column space of Y, then how much, how well do I approximate? So that's what I'm doing here. The theoretically minimal value is the K plus one singular value, so I will show you how well we do relative to the optimal one. The first example is uh, is really the example that started this whole adventure for us back 15, 20 years ago. So we were looking at uh, scattering matrices. So you have some sort of acoustic wave or something that hits an object, it gets reflected, and the linear map that maps the incoming field to the outgoing field is a, a scattering matrix. And they have the property that their singular values don't decay for a long time until you resolve. So basically, you need two points per wavelength or something for one dimensional object. It's uh, three dimensional objects, it's four points per square wavelength, like this. And then once you've exhausted that information, after that, things decay very fast. You, you cannot get more information out of the system. So in this case, you go from singular values of size over one down to machine precision in the range of just going from 40 to so the singular values decay very rapidly. And in these cases, uh, the randomized SVD that I just described, it works beautifully. It gives you basically optimal results, even the most simple version of it. And if you do one or two steps of power iteration, then it completely links. You get basically optimal results. 
Of course, in practice, oftentimes you need to work with matrices of supervised decay more slowly. And in particular, when you're in data mining, if you look at, you, know, you have graph Laplaces or something, you'll have a few outlying eigenvalues that are larger than the rest, but then they flatten out and you get very flat decay. You could have noisy data. So if you have five or 10 percent noise in your data, then it's just the, the components that stick out without the noise that have any meaning. And then once you decay down to 5%, then everything else is just junk. And your job is to really sort out that little bit that sticks out. And in that case, unfortunately, the basic scheme performs quite poorly. So that's the red line. But if you do one or two steps of power iteration, you quickly recover. You get to a and this is really an important point, that you don't need to take many steps of power iteration, but if you, if you approach this as a cradle method, and you want an approximation of rank 100, then in a basic cradle method, you need to do 100 interactions with the original matrix. So here, if we do this one, so now it's 5 plus 1, so it's 6 interactions instead of 100. So that's really where you get the main computational acceleration. Now, the other thing to mention is that, of course, when, when you talk about a randomized algorithm, the output is a random variable. But it depends on the draw of your Gaussian random matrix. How did you instantiate that? And every time you run the algorithm, you might get a slightly different result. So in order to describe it, you can't just show one graph like we did before. We want to somehow estimate the, the probability distribution of the output. So here, the thicker red line is the empirical mean of 100 different instantiations. The light red lines are the 100 instantiations. So the thing that's important here is that there's very little variation around the mean, which is what you really want. So you want two things to simplify out of a randomized algorithm. One is that you want it to perform well in expectation. There are tons of algorithms, some very stupid, that perform correctly in expectation. But the other key thing you really want is that you want the variation to be small. You want to typically be very close to the mean, and you want to basically never have a situation where you're far from the mean. And these techniques do satisfy these criteria. When you have slow decay, then you have a little bit more variation, but basically they're very safe to work with. For the basic case, we use a Gaussian random matrix. You can analyze things and uh, with proven theorems that capture things very precisely. So for instance, you can prove estimates like a bound like this. So first you prove a bound on what is the expectation of the error. Then you can have associated bounds on the, uh, on the variation. The key thing to note here is that uh, it makes a big difference whether you measure the error in Frobenius norm or spectrum. For Venus norm, so the, the upside here is that you're doing very well, that this bound is very gratifying to me, that it's, you're very close. So this is the minimal error, according to Eckhart Young, when you measure things in the For Venus norm, and we're just this relatively small factor within the optimal one. Okay, now the bad thing about the For Venus norm is when you work with, uh, with noisy data, it, it's basically a, a pointless metric. There's almost no difference between your correct approximation to the matrix and a completely useless one. They're very hard to differentiate when you measure the Frobenius norm. So you're typically interested in the spectral norm, and then unfortunately you have to still pay the price. So this is the, the sort of sad story of the analysis of the randomized SVD that we have to pay on the right hand side I have the Frobenius norm error instead of just this guy. But this is where power iteration comes then I really boost the, I boost the speed of decay in the tail singular values, and so I can suppress this term. I get very close to the optimal. Okay, so that's the basic randomized SVD. Any questions at this point? No. I hope I'm not boring you too badly. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you some variations. So what I've been doing so far, it leads to acceleration over classical deterministic methods, but it's, it's sort of polishing the constants, the prefactors. 
forms of plastering practice, but for sort of pedestrian reasons that you minimize communication, you can implement it on a GPU, this kind of thing. It's, it's not something that a theoretical computer scientist would be impressed by in the least. So next, though, let's try to see if we can do something a little bit more interesting. So before I do the interesting stuff, I'm going to just reformulate the algorithm. So I'm following work, recent work by Eugenia Katsukasa is illustrating these things. I really like the way it's presented these algorithms. So what, what I'm aiming for here is that I want to, so here's my approximation, Q, Q star A, and I want to express this without the Q, because this term it depends on two things. It depends on A and omega, then Y and Q are just two intermediate factors. They, for the purposes of analyzing and understanding things, you might, you, it would be nice to get rid of them. And one particularly elegant way of getting rid of them is through the more Penrose pseudo inverse, which I'm sure you've all seen. The main property I'm going to use is that if you have a tall matrix X, then X times the pseudo inverse is the orthogonal projection onto the column space of X. Okay? So Q, Q star here is the orthogonal projection onto the span of the columns of Q, which is the same as the span of the columns of A, Y, which is the same as the span of the columns of A omega. So now I can rewrite my approximation as follows. So now I got rid of Q and Y. So this is really the approximation of A that I'm interested in. So now, the interesting thing is, uh, so, so far I've been talking about approximating the column space. Of course, I can do exactly the same thing to the row space of the matrix. If I form random linear combinations of the row of A, then by exactly the same arguments as what I've been telling you about, I should expect to get a good basis for the row space. So let's do that as well. So I'll draw uh, another Gaussian matrix that's thin this way. I call it psi, and then the rows of psi times a form an approximate basis of the row space, and then I get, if I apply that from the right, I get this approximation. Okay. So now I did one additional approximation. This is going to be a little bit worse than that, but not very much. And then you observe that if you do a little bit of algebra, you can just rewrite this to the simpler form. So you write A as A omega, that's your basis for the column space, psi A is the basis you use for the row space, and then you have this projected matrix in the middle. So that is what Yuji refers to as the generalized nice method. And now we can start to do interesting things that actually move move the needle in a significant way, even from a theoretical point of view compared to classical stuff. And the first thing we'll do is that you'll observe that in order, so in order to evaluate this approximation, I need to compute A omega and I need to compute psi A. If I have those two, then I can, of course, trivially just compute this one once I'm done. And the point now is that I can, I can execute two matrix vector multiplies in a single pass of the matrix. So I don't even, if it's stored on a hard drive, I don't need to read it twice. I can do it just once. And uh, this is something that, to the best of my knowledge, cannot be done using deterministic methods. So now we've constructed a, a single pass algorithm for a low rank approximation, which I find very interesting. Um, this does perform a little bit worse, but if you can do the two-step one, that generally is a little bit better for the same amount of matrix vector multiplies. So, you know, for the specific case where the matrix is stored on a hard drive, you should just pay the price and read it twice. That, that's better than doing this. But um, there, are some, there are many situations where you just cannot store the matrix if you have a gigantic data set or something like this. And uh, I'm leaving out a lot of details. So you, it's advantageous to use like different sample sizes on the left and the right. You can get an additional sketch for this core that turns out to improve things. It's very important work that Madeline was doing. And uh, there are lots of variations on this basic scheme. But uh, the fact that randomized methods lead to streaming algorithms is quite fascinating. Um, one thing here, though, is that here you do really need an a priori bound on the rank. 
that you have to, before you run the algorithm, you have to decide what is the maximum rank that I'm likely to encounter. If you, if you populate these, say you have 100 columns here and 100 rows here, then if the rank turns out to be larger than 100, then you're cooked. There's nothing you can do. You can also not do the power iteration in this environment with us and others. So there are certain rules. Whereas in the basic RSVD, if you, if you run the algorithm as I described it and you find you don't get enough accuracy, you can just come back and take a second bite of the apple. All the information you've computed is going to be useful to you, so there's not even any waste. You just can go back, collect more samples, you add those to your bases, and there's really no loss. Okay, so the other fun thing we can do once we have this expression is that we can uh, we can improve on the asymptotic accuracy. So notice that the asymptotic cost, the plot count. So notice that the computing these matrix matrix multiplies, so the inner dimension, the, I have k columns in the median, I have k rows on the side. So if A is dense, so now I'm talking about the environment where A is dense, then the cost of these two steps is M and K. And that's exactly the same as Pascal algorithms if you run Pascal column pivoting, that has cost M and K. If you do K steps of the Krylov method on a dense matrix, that has cost M and K. So as long as we use Gaussians, we're really talking about improving the prefactors of those methods. But now, the interesting thing is that you can, if you use you can use random matrices here that have eternal structure that allows, that permits you to do the matrix matrix multiply faster. And there's a range of different things that have been proposed. So you can use various trigonometric transforms. You can do like an FFT that you subsample, you scramble the data a little bit first, and then you compute a limited FFT where you, what you do is you draw randomly a subset of the components in frequency steps, and you just evaluate those. And there are variations of the FFT that lets you do that very fast, so you can apply such a transforming cost M and log K. And once you've extracted the samples, then all additional computations have cost only MK squared or NK squared. So this is a real game. There are lots of other things you can use, chains of Gibbons rotations. Where, um, I, I find it very interesting to think about what are transforms that you can do very fast. You can apply fast on the hardware. But one that is a very strong contender as the best possible structure one that I found so far is this bar sign matrix. So it's not my idea, I should be clear. But uh, I've played around with it extensively, and it, it's so simple, it feels like it, it's a cheat. It shouldn't. Intuit, my intuition still tells me that it shouldn't work. But basically, all practical experiments I've tried it, it does work very well. And uh, it looks like this. So here is my matrix A. Now I use a random matrix that is sparse, is the main point. So you can be super aggressive in the sparsity and put just a couple of entries in each column. Then I will sample just a subset of the columns, and I will get an algorithm that has complexity less than MN. But this, this cannot work for a general matrix. For that to work, you have to make some prior assumption on the matrix. But what you can do without prior assumptions is that you can be a little bit less aggressive and pull just a couple of non-zero entries on each row. So what that means is that um, each column contributes to two other columns in your sample. And that turns out to work really strangely well. I mean, two is a little bit pushing, but if you go to three or four, it's really very stable. So this turns out to work very well. And I have the advantage that it's not too hard to code. Like, you can use the existing sparse matrix functionality in MATLAB or whatever your program languages to implement these things. So this works very nicely. Let me pull up some numerical experiments from a different school. Um, okay, so here are some accuracy experiments. 
just show how do different random matrices compare. So Gaussian is sort of the gold standard. It's, it's in some senses theoretical. The substandard Fourier transform oftentimes performs very similarly to the Gaussian. Another interesting twist here is that for the Gaussian, we have very precise theory. It's very close to optimal. So on all of these structured ones, the theory is quite weak. But in principle, you need to dramatically increase the number of samples. You need a much, you need something like k-squared samples or something, which um, is very problematic. If it were not for the fact that this, this is a, an artifact. In practice, you basically never see it. You can construct a counter example where you would need a lot of samples, but in practice, you don't. In practice, they behave basically the same. So the sparse one, it behaves a little bit worse for a fixed rank. But remember that this is vastly faster to compute, so you can afford to take twice as many samples and still win on time. Here's another example, which we see the sparse sine matrix does perform slightly worse, but again, it's so cheap that you can compensate for that by increasing the rank. Here's another example. And in terms of speed, it's really quite dramatic. So the point of this graph, there are two points to this graph. One is that the sparse sign matrix is really fast in many environments. The other one is that the fast trigonometric transforms, you have to go to slightly larger ranks for this to make sense. So if, you, if your matrix has a relatively low rank, the rank is 20 or 50 or something, then don't worry about it, just use the Gaussian works fine. Um, but if you're interested in cases where the rank is larger, up towards 500 or something, that's where the fast trigonometric transforms start to make more sense. All right. So any questions at this point? So how come, how come you can't use the middle matrix in your in part two to do adaptive things in K? Can I look at the singular values of psi A omega to try to get some adaptation in this in K to see if I've got the rank correct? Yes. Yes, I mean so you, you can there, there are signs in the data that you have where there you've succeeded or not. So yes, you probably can get a warning flag. In the, you, you're talking about the single pass. Uh, I was talking about this. When I, the structured. Uh, I, I don't think it matters whether they're structured or not. But I was thinking about taking the singular value decomposition of psi a omega, mm -hmm. looking at its singular values. Mm -hmm. And if they decay to the low tolerance, then I'm definitely good. If mm -hmm. they're above, then I need to go back and Get a few more yes. yes, you can definitely do that. And it's, it's cheap. So if you use a sparse sign matrix, then extracting this is cheap. So something that I'm personally quite interested in, but I basically most of my colleagues think that this is very boring. But I, I'm thinking a lot about how can we design software that actually implements these things. Because you're saying that in several parameters, there's the one parameter, should I use power method? power iteration or not, how much oversampling should I do, do I know in advance what the rank is, and then what, you, what you're describing comes in very strongly in this, that I think one way of resolving these issues is to start by using one of these cheap transforms, vastly overestimate the rank, compute this guy, its spectrum will not be an accurate approximation to the spectrum of A, but it will give you some or some idea of how rapidly it's the case, what is the actual numerical rank, so position, whatever the user wants, and then you can make parameter choices that go back to the uh, Yes, Fun. So it's a low rank approximation problem where I made, I constrain myself. So I'm looking not for a general factorization. I'm constraining myself to having one or both of the long factors be sub 
sets, the sub-matrices of the original matrix. So for instance, in the column selection problem, I'm aiming to find k columns of A that form a reasonably good basis for the column space of A. So rather than having linear combinations of the columns of A, I want to find k indices. That's, that's the sort of output of this algorithm. So why would you care about that? So one answer is that interpretation. Say your data is, uh, you're analyzing the stock market. Each column represents one stock. And if you run PCA on this, it would say that sort of linear combinations of stocks are interesting or sort of revealing underlying structure in the data. But sometimes it could be more helpful to, have, to identify individual stocks that if you want to know how this this cluster that represents oil influence companies, then you just look at X or something like this, uh, or in genetic analysis. This factorizations like this, they preserve structure, but if A is sparse, and if the rank is large, then you probably cannot afford to compute single vectors that are dense, because that would require a lot of storage. So in that case, finding is that a subset of the columns of A would be very handy if you uh, it uh, can be a first step towards no negative matrix factorizations, and so forth. So what are the standard tools for this? So if you look at classical textbooks, then the, the simplest way of doing this is exactly the common pivoting QR that I described at the beginning, the Gram-Schmidt, where just selecting the largest surviving vector at every step. This performs very well in practice. But it, it's, it's a little bit expensive, in particular if you think of a large sparse matrix, then Van Schmidt is probably not what you want to do. It's going to get very expensive. Uh, there are specialized versions of column pivoting that are provably going to get you an answer that's close to the theoretical optimal one, which is very interesting from a theoretical point of view, but they're not rarely used. You can sample, so you can sort of randomly pick a few columns of A. This works very well for certain classes of matrices. If you have gigantic matrices, for instance, um, people have been applying this in computational chemistry where the matrix is enormous. It can be very successful if you have a prior information. Um, or cases where the matrix is not necessarily very large, but it's expensive to evaluate. But in that case, sampling strategies can work well. But it's not really competitive to pivoting strategies for a given matrix size. So what is competitive, though, and what actually outperforms classical sampling strategies by a wide margin is the following. So I, I just want to mention this. So there, there's a really powerful method where you take your matrix A. So if I want to find the subset of the columns of A that form a good basis for the column space, what I can do is I can draw one of these random embeddings, omega, and you squash down A to form a small sketch of it. So my sketch matrix Y consists of random linear combinations of the rows of A. And then it turns out that if you do, if you apply your classical sketching strategy down here, that oftentimes gives you more or less identical results to not identical in the sense that you pick the same columns, but you pick columns that do as good of a job. So this is um, and this is quite fun. And it really accelerates things dramatically. Think of A as being very large and sparse. That's sort of the obvious case. But the other case is that even if A is a large-ish matrix, it doesn't have to be huge, say it's like 5,000 like 5, or something, then still performing column with if you are on it, is, it, it's really quite slow. It has complexity M and K, but it's, it's not a fast computation because it consists of a sequence of rank one updates. So for every step, you need to load the entire matrix from RAM into cache that goes through the process. So if you can work on a sketch instead that you can fit much closer to the processor, you can get quite dramatic accelerations. Uh, for doing this, using the sparse random embeddings turns out to be very powerful. They're really an ideal choice for the sketching matrix omega. Um, and the other thing that I've discovered in recent years, which was really surprising to me, is that you don't have to do column pivoted QR on your sample matrix. You can actually do partially pivoted LU, which for the numerical linear algebra geeks among you, you know that that's much faster because it does do 
don't, you can block it. You don't have to read in the entire matrix. You can start working on the top rows without looking at the remaining ones, which was known that this could be done for Gaussian matrices and various random matrices, but it actually works even for the sample matrix that we use here. And uh, if you use a sparse random matrix, you can now bring down the complexity to Mn plus k squared n, which I am first pleased with. Because Mn is the amount of input data, so you can't really expect to be much better for the case of a dense matrix. All right. Um, ah, one more thing. So, selecting columns turns out to also be the computational bottleneck of doing a column in the UR. So, I told you a little while ago that in order to take these steps of column through the QR, you need to read the entire matrix into RAM k times. Uh, from RAM into cache, k times. So you can actually use this trick that I just described to circumvent this requirement. So you can, so um, what I'm talking about here is not changing the overall complexity. All these methods have complexity n cubed asymptotically for an n by n dense matrix. But if you use this randomization step, what it allows you to do is to compute, say, a set of 100 pivoting columns at a time. So I need to do much less communication. I really reduce the amount of communication in the algorithm rather than the number of blocks. And these days, that really is where the bottleneck is for computational speed. So we, we demonstrated that by using this technique, we could improve on I do the MKL implementation of LA pack. We could accelerate by a factor of five by using this technique, which yeah. I, I, I really need to out about these things. Okay, so this last topic, it's my slides are going to be a little bit rough. I wasn't sure if I could talk about it, but when I talked to a couple of you yesterday, I gathered that there was interest, so let me talk about this. So the first couple of slides I've used in many talks, they are reasonably clean, but they might, it's going to get a little rougher here shortly. So the last topic I was going to talk about is uh, approximation of rank structure matrices. So these are matrices that are themselves not of low rank, but they have the property that you can chop them up into pieces, into O of n pieces, in such a way that each piece has low numerical rank. So think of this as being an, a discretized integral operator. So any of the Calderon sigma operators from mathematical physics, they all have some property like this. So this could be the scattering matrix I described earlier for acoustic scattering. Uh, so eventually that does become no rank, but in the stage prior to that, it has a structure like this. Uh, Dirich Hicks and Neumann operators of all types that arise. For kernel matrices in uh, data learning, at least, in uh, data science applications, have this structure at least if there's an underlying point set that's in lower dimensional space. So you, so you simulate some Gaussian process in two or three dimensions or something like this. Oftentimes, you get a matrix like this. And so this is a dense matrix of size n by n, but the amount of information in it is much less than n squared. So the amount of information is oftentimes n times k or something like that. And then you can do things like get a new factorization of it that's slightly higher cost, so n k squared, or sometimes a log n factor in there, but close to the near time. So this has really let you work on large dense matrices much more efficiently. And this is a sort of a linear algebraic interpretation of the fast multiple really relies on a tessellation like this on the line. Thanks. So now what I want to do is I want to get the data sparse approximation of that rank structure matrix through randomized sampling. So my template here is just the randomized SP. So I showed you how if A has globally low rank, then what I do is I Pull tall thin Gaussian matrices, or maybe on the side, and then I collect the samples, and then I can reconstruct A from this information. So now the question is, can I do the same thing for a rank structure matrix? So if I have a fast matrix vector multiply, so before I tell you how to do this, the answer is yes. Let me tell you why I care. So there are many cases where I can do a fast matrix. 
So for instance, if you have any of these operators from classical mathematical physics, any of the integral operators, they, for most of them, people have worked out fast algorithms for doing the matrix vector multiply. So for instance, the FMM. So now if I have an FMM, so the FMM I cannot straightforwardly invert. That doesn't allow me to do that new factorization. But if I have an FNMM, and then I convert it to a rank structure format that does allow me to do a new factorization, then I've now really opened up my toolbox. I can do tons more things. The main customer of the methods I'm going to describe have been people who work on large, large solvers. So you discretize the PDE into three dimensions, you get a gigantic sparse linear system, and uh, then when people do in industry, oftentimes they really like direct methods, so they compute an LDU factorization of it. And this gets expensive because when you do the LDU, you get filling, you get larger and larger dense matrices, particularly the ones around the diagonal are problematic, but those matrices turn out to be rank structure. And the way they arise in the algorithms is through the sure complement formula. So there's some sparse matrix times the inverse of a prior sure complement times another sparse matrix. And in that case, I do have tools for fast application of the algorithm of the matrix. Okay, so what was known until about a year ago were two classes of methods. There was one class that had true linear complexity and is very fast in practice. But it had a big drawback in that uh, it required, in, you had to be able to evaluate some individual entries. And then there was a set of true black box algorithms, but they were quite slow in practice. There was a log factor in the complexity that shouldn't be there. The underlying problem did not have, the underlying problem has complexity and k, so the complexity of the algorithm was irritating that it was mk times log. So we want to get rid of that. And this is where things might get a little rough. So my student who defended just last week, James Levitt, I took these slides from his defense. So let me just describe. So I'll describe how it works for the simplest possible rank structure matrix. So it's just a flat tessellation. So what I want to do is I want to build the basis for the blue box. And there's a side constraint here for technical reasons, you want to use the same basis for the column space of all the blocks in one block row. So I really want to build, I want to apply the randomized SVD to this block, basically. These three sub-blocks taken together. I want to apply the randomized SVD to that. So how can I do that? So this is the straightforward way. The, the most natural thing to do is you build a Gaussian random matrix that's partitioned conformally and then you just zero out the top block so that you kill the contributions from the dense diagonal block. This works great, but it's very wasteful. You see I can't use the information in these samples and then when I want to build the basis for these three blocks I have to redo and it's, it's not a viable algorithm. So then this uh, method that I devised almost 15 years ago um, is the non-black box one. So I, I realized that the number of matrix elements you actually need is quite small. So I can just evaluate the diagonal block and then subtract out its contribution and then I get a pure sample from these guys. So that's very straightforward, but then it turned out you can actually do this hierarchy. You could do it at all levels in the representation of the matrix. And this was actually in Cymax. We talked about whether Cymax likes rank structured matrices or not. For your 2016 model, it's <laughs> yes. yes. OK, so this is what I and James came up with recently. So there's a more clever way of doing this, which eluded me for 10 years. So I'm very psyched about this. So what you do is that, is that you fatten your Gaussian matrix a little bit. So you, you draw, so think of, think of the rank here as being k and the diagonal block size as 2k, then I pull 3k columns in my Gaussian matrix. And that means that now this block will have a null space. So I can compute an orthogonal basis for that null space very cheaply. And then if I right multiply, 
the sample matrix, then if you look at it in this product, that has the effect of zeroing out this flow. So now I get an unpolluted sample from these three. And the beauty is that I can do this sample once and for all. I just draw this one Gaussian matrix, I collect the one sample Y, and then by doing this trick, I can get unpolluted samples for all the blocks. And then the other step that was harder was figuring out to do this hierarchy. Like, so this you can do for, uh, for a flat tessellation on the matrix. It doesn't work for one of these hierarchical things. But with some additional trouble, you actually can make it work hierarchically. I'll save you the details, but here is the final algorithm. So this is not published. It's in my student's dissertation. It'll be available shortly. The point being that it's a relatively short. But the, the total algorithm is quite clean. And one interesting thing is that for this to work, so the other thing you gain by taking a slightly fatter random matrix is that the, the blocks associated with each dagger block are now slightly fat, which means that they are invertible. They, they can stably be invertible. They have a pseudo inverse that's numerically stable. So this is how I can back out the diagonal blocks. And it all works very well. We have extensive numerical experiments. It has high practical speed. This is just running on my student's Mac. Go up to a million degrees of freedom, and it takes a couple minutes. So this works well. It is very numerically stable. You see slow increase in errors. You do get a bit of aggregation as we get hierarchical matrices that are deeper and deeper. You lose a little bit of accuracy. But this is very standard in this environment. Yeah, there are a bunch of numerical experiments. But yeah, I was very excited about this because it's something I've thought about for a long time. And we finally do this. So now you can do this, basically. You have these right structured matrices. And you can analyze them. You can compute the data sparse approximation to them. Um, basic in the same asymptotic complexity as a global go around. It's a larger prefactor, of course. So, what we do, so one thing I learned yesterday is that you apparently outdone us a little bit in that you have a way of doing the reconstruction in slightly fewer matrix vector multipliers. So, I think you guys had 4NK and we have 6 But you have more expensive reconstruction. So, yes, but these are very fun All right, I'm out of time. That may move to my last slide. So, key points about the randomized SCB. So, they're very fast in practice. We have these nice properties of improving, you know, asymptotic complexity and so on. But to me, the main advantage is really to exploit the matrix matrix multiply. It's much faster than a sequence of K consecutive matrix. This implements very fast in modern hardware. It's easy to use in almost every computing environment you work with. If it's you know, distributed computing, whatever it is, somebody has always done the matrix matrix multiply. It's one of the first things that get implemented. And it's really the only way you need to interact with the data. So it's very easy to implement in many situations. And you could do these fun things, reduce the asymptotic complexity, you can have single pass algorithms. Then I talked a little bit about current research directions. I'm mentioned very really interested in high performance implementations of this. We are working on full matrix factorizations, so the full column pivoted QR, trying to beat the late pack basically in different environments. What I didn't talk about today is um, there's a number of results for solvers for the new systems, randomized conditioning, it's a huge topic. I think a lot more can be done there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Area. I did talk about randomized uh, compression of rank structure matrices. Alex has been working on the continuum analog of this, which is really interesting. Very fascinating questions there. And then, of course, there are tons of applications of randomized embeddings outside of linear algebra. If you want to do clustering or analyzing data point sets in very high dimensional spaces, then the general idea of randomized embeddings is very powerful. And we're doing research in that direction as well. Here are some references. There's a survey that Alex mentioned 
starting point. If you want to catch up with more recent work, we have an update to that. For other sort of beginner ones, I've given a number of summer schools and new courses that are available on the web. There's some software, I wish there was more. I'm working on it. So hopefully next time there will be the unified package down here. So, so that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Donna. Uh, questions? So for the uh, for the PDE example, like this hierarchical method, how does that combine with the uh, the structured random matrices? Like so, like if I used a really sparse random matrix and hit it against a, a differential operator, I would expect bad things to happen. Is that a worry that you come up with? Or? So they really two com as I see it, they're, they're two complementary environments. So in either case, you want to multiply the matrix A by your test matrix omega. So in the environment where A is dense, it's very attractive to have structure in A, A in omega. Then this environment is sort of the opposite one. I have a lot of structure in A that allows me to do the matrix matrix multiply fast. In most of those cases, you could, in principle, accelerate a little bit, perhaps, by using structures inside omega. But for the most part, Gaussian sampling works well, because it, it's not the dominant part of the cost. In that case, it's nice to have the theoretically optimal stuff. Like some of these algorithms have some internal structure in omega that maybe you zero out certain blocks or you can do barcoding tricks and stuff, but it's all based on blocks of Gaussian random matrices, or at least the ones that I've been working with. Anything else? So I guess for the black box sort of algorithms at the end, I guess when they're in this like PD case or spatial statistics case or something, knowing the hierarchy or the structure to put down, is often very natural. Mm -hmm. I guess you also mentioned, you can know, say, kernel matrix data analysis or high dimensional data, that gets a bit mm -hmm. trickier. I'm curious if you thought much about how you can sort of interlace these ideas to either I identify have, a structure or. I had started thinking about those things and I got a bad headache and I stopped. <laughs> but other people have. So, for instance, my, the student who did this work, James Lovett, he has worked with uh, George Bureaus on exactly that problem and they have. Fairly compelling results for symmetric, also definite matrices. Because in that case, looking just at the diagonal entries provides you a lot of information. So that will let. So the, the question that is really the, the way we're thinking about these questions is that a matrix, if a matrix has rank structure, it's, it's dependent on the ordering of the columns in the row. So can you find the permutation? What, what is the best order that gives you the most appealing? rank structure in the orthogonal box. So the, the question is, can you find an ordering of the columns and the rows? And then, of course, second to that comes, downstream comes the question of actually computing the, the rank. But, uh, but they have looked at that, and it's, for a symmetric cost of definite, it's, it's somewhat robust that you can actually get things that work relatively reliably. Then they have some more sampling-based techniques that have more of the character of Monte Carlo method. There are lots of heuristics there, and when you apply them in practice, sometimes they work well, sometimes they don't. In defense of those methods, as you can tell, you can try, and you can actually test at the end, did you get an accurate approximation or not? But that's it's a really hard problem. And I, I think if you're happy with methods that have Monte Carlo type behavior, though, you get, you know, one digit or something, then probably yes. I think getting high precision approximations there is going to be challenging. Does the algorithm that you presented in the last part generalize to two and three dimensions? Um, because what you showed was a very specific, because you showed it in the matrix way, mm -hmm. rather than the tree way. Yep. I wasn't sure if it extends to high dimensions. Um, so, 
So you work to be precise for this structure for hierarchically block separable matrices, or HSS is another word for it. And they, they work, as you imply, they work extremely well for objects that have an underlying one dimensional structure. So for instance, with boundary two equations on a contour in two dimensions, that's really where they excel. They can be applied to a lot of problems in two dimensions as well, but they are a little bit less efficient there because the ranks go up. But they don't go up badly in two dimensions. In two dimensions, if you go from, from one dimensional problems, rank 20 is all the time is good enough, 30 is certainly. If you look at problems where the underlying data is really two dimensional, then you go up to ranks of a couple of hundred, which slows things down, but you still get decent accuracy. They work in that environment. Going to 3D volume problems would not work, then the rank would explode. But now, what's, what's nice about this is that many problems that are in 3D can be formulated so that the computational domain is two-dimensional. So the scattering problem, for instance, that lives on the surface of the scatter, and that is a two-dimensional object. So the HPS structure does work. It's, not, it's a little bit slow. It's not as fast as it is for a one-dimensional object, but for a two-dimensional object, it's fine. And conversely, the other main application here that we have in mind are sparse solvers in three-dimensional spaces. And uh, the, the rank-structured matrix lives on the mesh dividers in that one. So in nested dissection order, you look at your computational mesh, you want to find a plane of points or a surface of points such that if you cut that out, the mesh falls into two disconnected pieces. So the, the, the set of points you need to cut out live on the two-dimensional object. So the answer is work fantastic for one dimensions, works reasonably well for 2D, and that actually lets you solve a lot of physics equations in three dimensions. But yeah, eventually it's not going to work. Okay. Uh, there are no more questions, let's make that again. And there are refreshments. <laughs> refreshments in the can space. Yeah.